Thank you, Jeff. So, so we're going to get started. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming. Uh, my name is Hai Peng Lee. I'm the university librarian at UC Merced. Now, throughout the, the day, the sessions that I've been to, um, there is uh, a lot of uh, discussions and talks about, uh, you know, issues from a theoretical kind of level, from a policy kind of level. So we're approaching this from a really pragmatic kind of level. We, you know, how we actually uh, planned on being, on building facilities like this and uh, put it to use, um, sort of um, have it now in operation. Um, you may have not heard about UC Merced, <laughs> uh, and I'm not surprised. Uh, UC Merced is one of the 10 campuses within the uh, University of California system. So, uh, and we're at the newest campus uh, within the system. So we are, um, we are only um, 13 years old, um, but we're growing like crazy. Um, by 2020, uh, we're, we'll have uh, 13 new additional buildings complete, completed. Uh, that's in two years. And then uh, we, you know, between now and uh, 2020, we'll have um, about 100 faculty positions to fill. And we'll continue to expand with our student population as well. So there are a lot of exciting things that are happening. There are also uh, a lot of challenges that we face. Um, if you uh, are not sure where UC Merced is, now here's a map of California, and you can see Merced is right in the middle of the state. Uh, it's really in the Central Valley, uh, where you know two and a half hours from San Francisco, you know two hours from Sacramento, uh, four hours from LA, and we're 1.5 hours to the Yosemite National Park. And these pictures that you've seen around the perimeter, some of them are about the city, others about the campus, and still there are a few that's about the Yosemite National Park. So, you know, the virtual reality is not an unfamiliar concept anymore. You know, it used to be to a lot of people. So, um, a simple definition uh, here is basically virtual reality is just a, a computer-generated interactive representation of an environment that looks like real. It really just, you know, mimics the, the, the real world. And uh, this technology has become uh, better and better, but it's still, you know, it's kind of um, getting there, but not quite. And, uh, you know, it's, it's this kind of uncanny valley kind of um, situation where uh, human beings are kind of hard to mimic, kind of hard to draw. Uh, so there is, there is, you can sort of see there is that, still that gap between virtual reality. There, there's a reason why Nemo was <laughs> Right, <laughs> right. Um, so, um, from my part, uh, I'm going to talk about the library cave uh, from the library's point of view, but also from the campus perspective. And my colleague Jeff will talk about the wave. We have another facility. Uh, you know, an academic building that is larger. All of this happened because of a uh, project that four campuses within the UC system, UCLA, UC Berkeley, UC San Diego, and UC Merced came together to um, collaborate on this, um, on this uh, project that, that was funded with a multi-million dollar funding to purchase these facilities to really support uh, the mostly humanities um, scholars' research. Uh, that's why we have a library cave uh, picture here, and then the wave, and also had UCSD uh, San Diego's wave here as well. Um, when we were planning on the library cave, we were really, uh, we had this idea of having uh, this facility somewhere that is visible, that is uh, easy to attract people, and easy to be exposed to students and to uh, users that come to the library. So this is a, a floor um, map of our second floor in the library. 
as you can see, uh, the star is where the uh, library cave is, and it's, you know, it's located right at the center of the floor. So, you know, students come in, uh, they, whether they here to do uh, just study or do research or to socialize with their friends, they will see this facility. And we had three, kind of three goals in mind when we're building this. One was to have it exposed to students so that um, we gauge their interest. The second one was we tried to embed a facility like this as a learning tool into teaching and learning and some level of student research. So, and the third goal is to uh, possibly to, to um, do demos to donor, potential donors. So when we have a lot of trustees that are very interested in sort of new technology and uh, these kinds of new initiatives. So we want to make sure that uh, we have this um, available for that purpose as well. So here's, uh, again, a picture of the library cave um, uh, right, right there. So uh, some of the features uh, of this, um, of this uh, facility, as you can see, um, actually it's not that complicated. It's pretty simple. Um, basically we have three, you know, it's not that big. We have three 72 inch, you know, LCD panels there. Um, you can't see it, uh, but you know, at the bottom, there is a computer behind it, you know, just one computer that's driving these uh, images, uh, these, these uh, TV panels. And uh, it serves multi-purposes, um, you know, uh, for various kinds of programs, like the CalVR, the 3D, uh, 2D kind of uh, programs. And uh, as I said, it's not that big. It's you know, 86 inches high and 110 inches wide and then 50 inches deep. So it's not a huge facility here. And you don't have to spend a whole a fortune to build something like this. We only spent uh, about 25K on something like this. Some people say, well, this technology is kind of outdated. And, uh, but I think you know, it serves our purpose. I think you know the faculty use this you know for their teaching and for for learning, so um, I think it's 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 quite good for for us. And um, we're getting into some technical uh, aspects I'm, of this. I'm, I'm wearing the hoodie. I'm the guy. <laughs> Jeff is the technical guy, but I'm going to give it a try. So the whole point about VR is really to create a environment where you feel that you are part of it. A part of it, so you're immersed in this uh, this environment, but you have to kind of position uh, the viewers um, at the right angle to be able to get the full field of view. So this is um, you know different sizes of the of the view and how you would position yourself um, in these kinds of environments. So the library cave is kind of in between the big picture and the middle picture. So it's about 6K, um, well, it's 12K. Um, and then the wave, which I'll talk about, is even bigger than all of these. And the idea is that the more field of view you can immerse yourself in, um, the more present and real um, the virtual reality will seem. Less virtual, more real. And as I said, one of the main goals was really to embed this into teaching. So we have one faculty member, uh, Professor Nicola Lucari, who actually um, is listed on the slide, uh, but he couldn't, he couldn't come, he, he, he's not available, he, he's at another conference. So he actually, we uh, started this uh, last year as a pilot using his class. So last year he taught a uh, world, world Heritage um, class 110, uh, called 3D Modeling uh, Cultural Heritage. Uh, and this, this semester, he's continuing to teach that. So he's teaching another one, also World Heritage 160, called uh, Methods in Digital Heritage. So um, he would bring his students here to the library and have these studio sessions, and students 
as you can see from the pictures, you know, students interact with the 3D and 2D kind of environment to show uh, the next slide, um, really sort of to um, present their lab assignments results, but also, you know, their uh, creations from these class assignments and, you know, sort of visualize, you know, uh, these kinds of findings. So it's really, um, you know, I, what I'm pleased about this is really embedded into the curricular planning. And um, so students, uh, they, they actually uh, assigned to use the facility for their, for their work. So um, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Jeff. Thank you. Yeah, so um, that was always in the plan, um, was to use the smaller facility for teaching and learning. And in fact, it's open. Anybody can just walk right up to it and start to use it. Um, uh, it it's got a couple of different modes. It can be a kiosk where people use a game controller, and the students are, are very familiar with that um, vernacular. Um, in this case, um, it's being used as a virtual studio for interactive design. Now. Um, what Haipong didn't mention was that these things are all on the network, so they're connected to each other. So when the, when the graduate assistant um, says, okay, everybody, we're going to meet at the library, we're going to do design review, um, he's not carrying a thumb drive around anywhere. We can actually push files um, up to this device over our Science DMZ network. Um, very, very fast. It's a 10 gigabit per second network. So they can have these uh, interactive design sessions um, and then be manipulating the files that reside on a server somewhere else in real time. And so it, it really allows them to do iterative design in a way that they couldn't do by submitting their homework, emailing, or, or, or these other ways of, uh, of collaborating. Now, um, other people have put these uh, small cave kiosks in libraries before. The Geisel Library here at UC San Diego is the first one. There's one at UC Berkeley's Hearst Museum um, of uh, Anthropology. There's one at uh, UCLA's museum. Um, but the wave, the big one, um, and I'll talk about that in a minute, um, was the first uh, one of its kind to actually go into a digital humanities space. These usually land in engineering, computer science, sometimes medical schools. Um, you see them in automotive design centers in one way or another, aerospace and, uh, and military applications. Never before had this technology been put into um, a humanities uh, lab. So uh, I came to the UC Merced in 2016 um, I'm retired faculty from the Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey, um, and I came all the way back from New Zealand, which is where I had retired, to build this lab. So it's really, really great. Um, it was for a while the largest walk-in VR facility in the world at 166 megapixels, um, which provides an incredible amount of immersion and sense of presence in this virtual environment. Um, Unlike putting on the headset where you're sort of isolated, this is really you're in a collaborative environment. It's a space for five or six people. Um, you can have multiple interactive uh, inputs. You can split the columns. Um, it's a very, very flexible system. Um, and this really more closely matches how we learn and how we collaborate together. So this is the technical stuff. It is why I wear the hoodie. Um, it's built from 24K OLED TV. So OLED is a different kind of technology than the LCD, the liquid crystal displays. It's actually, each pixel is its own light source. And since it's its own light source, if it's black, it turns off. If it's white, it lights up. So the dynamic range and the brightness is really, really incredible. Um, they are stunning televisions and I'm afraid once you visit the wave, um, this will ruin your home television forever. So come in at your, uh, 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 be forewarned. It does have 10 rendering nodes and those are high-end um, Linux-based machines and each one has a dedicated uh, GTX 1080 graphics card for each one of the screens. 
And we do that so we can really push the system in ways um, that gamers would push the system. Um, like I said, it's connected up to the network at a very fast speed, 10 gigabit. We have 10 gigabit per second connection to the outside world and 10 gigabit connection in between each computer. Now, to give you a little perspective, you're probably not a network engineer, 10 gigabits is actually somewhere around 10,000 times faster than your high-speed internet at home if you have 100 megabit per second. So it's quite fast. We can do um, multiple terabyte file transfers in a matter of hours. We can do gigabyte file transfers in a matter of seconds. So um, when we do collaboration with UC San Diego, we're just pushing these multi-gigabit files around like crazy and uh, of course the network engineers think there's a denial of service attack going on, but really we're just doing research. Um, we do have uh, tracking and you know, if you, if you heard the keynote this morning, you realize, oh wow, we could, be, we, we could be really studying how people interact in these. We're not doing that yet. We use our tracker for just um, user interaction because a tiny little mouse pointer would get completely lost on this screen. Um, so we use a different way. Um, but we can tell where you're looking and what you're pointing at. Um, Interestingly, we also put a Dolby Atmos 11.2 uh, surround sound system in there, and that's as good as it gets um, if you're out in a theater. Uh, it's a really, really nice system, and we can render 3D audio in this space as well. Now, if you look at this image, you're like, well, that's kind of weird. It's sort of just crammed in there. This room actually wasn't designed for this um, installation. So we retrofitted the installation to fit the room, and that means, um, uh, even though you don't have a brand new building that's purpose built for this kind of stuff, you can have one of these too because they're very flexible in their design. Now there's nothing in here that's um, you know, really revolutionary. Most of this technology has been around for a long time. The spiffiest thing are the 4K OLED TVs. Most everything else you can buy from Best Buy or, or B&H Photo and Video. So um, it's not really... Uh, uh, revolutionary, it's more evolutionary. And this is the 13th or 14th one of these that I've built over the last 10 or 15 years um, it, with Tom DeFonte from C, uh, UCSD as, as lead, of course. Uh, and this last bullet point here is something that I want to emphasize. We took the savings that we uh, accrued by using this off-the-shelf commercially available stuff and we spent about $100,000 on building an ecosystem. So everything that you would need to use to build content for this is already included. So we have the Wave, which is the front of the house, and we have the Wave Lab, which we invite people into to create content. Um, so that's one of the ways that we foster adoption, um, both for these more research-oriented um, facilities like the Wave and the public uh, facilities like the library cave. First rule, and Haipang hinted at it, it's location, location, location. So in the library's case, front and center, right in the middle of the second floor, right where all the students are at. For me in the wave, it's in the digital humanities lab. So as the centerpiece to that DH lab, we have the wave. Um, keep the system open and running during regular business hours. That's rule two. Um, I walk by the way the library cave every morning when I get into work to make sure that it's up and running. These things do not survive benign neglect. They take active management. Every day you've got to be checking on, you know, is the system healthy? Is it running? Is it doing what it's supposed to be doing? Sometimes the fix is really simple. Oh, we have to turn the TVs on. Sometimes the fix is a little harder. Oh, we have to reboot the system. But every day we do a health check. Um, rule number three I've also hinted at, be permissive with access. We are inviting people to use these resources. Um, I have an intern in the Wave Lab and I actually got him because I left the door open. And he walked in and he said, wow, what is this? And I explained it to him and he's been, it's been the best. Um, he's, he, he's there for me whenever I need him. And if I'd had the door closed, I wouldn't have that intern. I wouldn't have provided that access. So don't put these in locked rooms, just staff them with an intern. 
and rule for empower others. So really, there's no way to make a mistake here. If, if you do something wrong, it's not harmful. You know, worst case scenario, we turn the lights on and, and plug it back in. Um, uh, so empower others to use this. And, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about how we uh, are empowering others um, at UC Merced by doing something that I think is actually unique. Um, and that is we have a docent guide program. So I have a, 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 some VIPs coming tomorrow to the Wave Lab, and I know that um, our student guides will go in there and give a great demo, doesn't cost me anything, doesn't cost our visitors anything, gives the students some really great experience, and it has been a student-led effort at UC Merced um, through the Student Success Internship Program. We focus on basic operation, simple troubleshooting, and navigation skills. That's step one. Um, we just let them kind of go wild in there. They can load any content they want, they can look at anything they want, um, and they can spend all afternoon in there if they have the time. Um, so they also get a basic understanding of the component technologies, a little bit more than I gave you, but you know, still enough to address any questions people might have. Um, and lastly, we have this um, student-developed uh, uh, magazine-style guidebook that tells them about the content that, they're, that they need to interpret. They can open up a page and read all about Luxor, Egypt, which is one of the locations where we have content from. And they can speak authoritatively and tell stories, which is how we, we learn um, around the content. So our motivations for, um, uh, for establishing this uh, innovative program were we wanted to reach into the future by engaging these undergraduate students. Many of these undergraduate students will go on and become graduate students. Some of them will go on and get their PhDs. They'll be aware of this technology. They'll use this technology. Um, so it's really about fostering a future where people understand this interdisciplinary collaborative framework that we're trying to build. Um, I can't be everywhere at once, people. So I'm here talking to you. That means I'm not in the lab giving a, demo, giving a demo or a tour. But having the student guides there means that business can continue. I have a, I have a, a, a plan for, for accommodating all the people that want to come through the lab. Now, we've probably had, since we opened in 2016, maybe close to 1,000 people come visit um, in one way or another. So it's a capacity building exercise. Um, we also give um, uh, uh, student groups, the uh, Student ACM, Association of Computing Machinery, Game Developers Club, um, uh, the VR Club, a focus for their activities. They can come in and, and they can use the system um, for their clubs. And it allows the older students, the juniors and the seniors to do near peer mentoring with the younger students. So I really, I, it's sort of self-perpetuating and in a way that I don't have to really get involved all that much and the students have really taken over. Um, and because I am just one person, um, this really speaks to the scalability and sustainability of um, the WAVE, the WAVE Lab, and the Library Cave. So here's my quick bullet list. Now, I, I, I put a slide in at the beginning uh, about VR not being a new technology, right? Well, I've been in the VR game for a really long time even by computer uh, science standards. Um, I started in virtual reality almost 25 years ago. I know I was a baby. And uh, uh, through the 90s, through the 2000s, I started in VR before there was a, any such thing as a graphics card. So um, uh, I have learned some really hard lessons about VR and what succeeds and what doesn't succeed. Um, first of all, you have to build that ecosystem. You, it's about the tools, it's about the workflow, supporting the researchers, supporting the educators to create content and display content. Um, you want to invite people in to share content. Um, you want to train non-experts. It doesn't take a computer scientist or a master's student um, or a PhD student to give a really great tour. Um, the undergraduates can do this as well. Um, we want to engage diverse academics and researchers. Now, I, I used to teach, and when I taught, I taught a visualization course, and I would ask the students, who are all master's students, how many people in the room use visualization? 
and maybe one or two would sheepishly raise their hand. Well, if you use a bar graph or you use PowerPoint or if you've ever shown anybody a picture of your dog, you use visualization. Um, so we can, we can engage the broadest set of constituents for this kind of infrastructure. It's not just for game development and computer scientists. And get it networked. Make sure that it's connected. There are dozens of these around California, hundreds of these around the United States, and perhaps a thousand or more around the world. Um, and because it's so easy and anyone can do it, hint, hint, um, we don't know how many of them are out there. Uh, so get it networked and, and build a network of people to use it every day. So there's a saying, it's a little crude, but in computer science we say, oh, we eat our own dog food. That means we make VR, we show VR, every day we use VR. Uh, and that's all I have to say. So I think we have some time for some questions, um, if you have them. I saw a few people taking some pictures of the technical things. You may have some technical questions or program questions for our librarian. And we have, let me check my timer here. We, we have about 10 minutes, so.